Bam. Well, here I am. Have you missed me? I don't know if you can even hear me. Let me check the settings because I was getting nervous about that stuff. Um, it looks like you can hear me. It looks like you can see me. I'm wearing a shirt that people hate. I'm sorry, but I like it. It looks nice in person. It doesn't look really great on the camera. And you know what? I mean, you're just going to have to deal with it. I'm a little talking a little lower this morning. I don't know. I'm just get. I'm just getting into it. Believe it or not, I haven't streamed since Friday. And Friday was a special report. You should probably watch that if you get a chance. It is a hoot. <laughs> um, I never really did a long form um, special on a live stream before, uh, where I just based it on one article and the contents and and kind of the greater the greater good and. I thought it went well. I, I don't know that I can do it very often. Um, let me put something in the chat just so that people know that I exist and I'm real. Yeah, here you go. Watch this. <laughs> uh, so anyway, how are you? Um, you know, it's, what is it, Tuesday? Yesterday didn't happen on the live stream. How do I explain it? Well, I really think it goes back to Friday. And um, just just so you know, we're going to change some things up today uh, going forward just to see if it, if it makes the show any, any more watchable. <laughs> so um, last, so I don't know if I've told you this, but as a real estate agent, what normally happens is, is, um, like say Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, even, even sometimes Monday, you'll see new listings come to the market, like just the, the listing itself. It won't go active until the weekend, which usually starts Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now I'm just giving you a base. Um, whenever you do see a property go active, like on a Tuesday, that's kind of odd. But anyway, so your, your whole week is kind of set up. Um, so like, it's kind of set up, the showings are set up that way, okay? And then all my buyers will call me and ask to see houses pretty much between Friday, Saturday, and Sunday because the way the market's been working for the past year or two is all the, you're going to have multiple offers and all the offers are due by, say, Sunday night with a response time of Monday or they're going to be due on Monday with a response time later Monday night. So you know, Monday is just typically a day of just not great because, you know, we can't get anything, we can't get anything under contract, it seems. And so, uh, so where's the day off there for a real estate agent? I don't really see it. And that's not a good thing. And so the thing is, you know how like teachers, typically work maybe say September, maybe late August to May and they have that time off. Well, real estate agents sort of get that. It's not really the same, but so in the winter, um, between about November, about Thanksgiving, the week of Thanksgiving till the first of the year, actually probably till March, like at least in St. Louis, yeah, we show houses, but it's not nearly at the at the breakneck speed that that happens during the summer. And so we're right into the the major part of the the showing season, if you will, the buying season, and they just get worn down. And so I, I kind of just wanted to go over, you know, what happened because, you know, yesterday I just didn't I didn't have anything to produce. Like I I was just worn out, and I don't know if you've noticed, but you know, there's been times that, that it just hasn't happened. Like we've just been worn out. Uh, we meaning me, it's, it's, I mean, I have more work than I can do every day and it's, it is what it is. So, um, part of me feels a little bad about YouTube in the sense that I like to live stream. I'd obviously like to build my channel. I'd obviously like you to come along with me, but, uh, but I know the guys that are doing live streams all the time, 
typically typically aren't aren't working like they're not doing a, a job all the time and then the ones that are usually like some of the ones that i've seen that actually have like full steady employment are are usually uh like you know kind of on the guest circuit if you will they're not producing their own show um i think you get a level of realism from my uh, streams because i work every day in the in the field and i don't know that many agents are actively doing streams um and i don't really i don't really care about anybody else because this is what i do um but i think i, I feel like i'm closer to the um the market than uh say someone that's you know sitting in a, an office all day but anyway so friday we well thursday it started thursday night you know can i see this property can i see that property? it ended up being friday starting at two that was yeah that was when it started so friday at two i had two showings and then I had to go out to West County and show a house. Then I had to stop by another agent friend and pick up some stuff from him. Then I needed to go to a different showing uh, Friday night. And so of those showings, okay, of those showings, my buyers, different buyers, there were different buyers in each showing. Of those showings, two offers, it was likely that I was going to have to write two offers, okay, for different buyers. And then I have a, a colleague who was out of town. And so on Saturday, I needed to show um, some houses for, for them, which is no big deal. And I don't mind. I, I would always do it. No, no big deal. And then I also needed to um, – I'm sorry. I, I also needed to uh, to do some other things. Now, this was a kind of uh, – a good weekend because my my wife was gone all weekend she had she had things she had to do so that was nice because you know you feel really bad if you don't spend any time with your family all weekend long um, but anyway so friday night around 10 o'clock i had seen enough houses and i knew i had to write offers and i got tired and so i told my my buyers i said hey can i can i check this out in the morning well once i did that the live stream saturday morning wasn't going to happen because I, I didn't have any time because i had to set up the showings for the showing started at noon on Saturday, so there was there was no time. I just had to start. Um, a lot of people think, oh, you just write an offer, but there's all these steps involved in writing an offer. You have to get comps. You have to run the tax records. You have to run. Um, you have to go back and forth with kind of how you're going to structure your offer. So my goal was on Saturday morning just to get the offers or just to get the information out to my buyers so that they could put together an offer that would be compelling in this market. I did that. And then on, uh, then I showed those houses, some really neat houses in St. Louis this weekend. Um, and I was happy to show them mostly in Tower Grove and Shaw, uh, those neighborhoods. And then I came back home and uh, I ate lunch because now it's like three o'clock and I hadn't eaten all day. And uh, then I started writing offers. Well, I got done writing offers somewhere around eight o'clock. I sent all my offers in. Um, you know, like some people play games in this market. Well, there's God, there's so many games. But one of the games that I'm 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 kind of tired of is if I put my offer in late, like right when the deadline comes in, then no one else is going to know my offer, and that'll be great. But the other problem is, is if I wait until the end to put in my offer, then I'm sitting there, um, you know, waiting for them to uh, like. I'm basically waiting to the last minute. So now I have to be nervous about making sure they get the offer and everything. I don't feel like it's worth it. Now you say, well, they can shop your offer to other people. It's like, well, they're going to shop your offer to other people anyway. And it just depends on the integrity and the ethics of the other agent. And you never know what that is going in. Even if you've worked with agents in the past, you have no idea what's what they're really thinking. So Saturday night, I got both of my offers in Sunday. I knew one of the offers was they were going to make a decision. And on the other one, I knew that they were likely to make a decision. So on the first offer, uh, the expiration was one o'clock on Sunday. Uh, I heard nothing from the agent, nothing. So let me just go over that for you. 
as a real estate agent, as an experienced real estate agent, you have these certain things that you do to be professional within your own industry. Okay. These rules aren't necessarily written down. It's just, it's just common courtesy. So one of the things is if someone bothers to write you an offer, even if it's a terrible offer, you say, thank you for the offer. Uh, if it's an offer below asking, you write a counter. Maybe there's some, there's some room there to write, to write a counter. Uh, and as the listing agent, it's kind of your responsibility to try to elicit a counter from your, your seller. Okay. In this case, I didn't get a counter. I didn't get a thank you. I didn't get anything. I got some really like 12 year old text written, like quality text. It was really bad. Uh, am I mad about it? No, no. Cause we'll continue with this. And so at one o'clock, I'm out on one offer. I'm out of contract. I'm, I didn't get the house. So my buyer's sad. Okay. The next one, they're making a decision between seven and 10. And at seven 30, I get an email that, that you're not getting the house. So now I've got two, two. So all I've got to show for the weekend is what exactly I have no, I have no accepted offers. I have the whole weekend is gone and nothing to show for it. And this happens every weekend. It's happened to me now for over a year. Now you say, well, John, do you get some deals? Yes, but it's, it's not, in, it's not even close to interesting anymore. As far as it's just, it's just a disaster. You know, it used to be maybe one or two people writing an offer on a house. Maybe you lose every once in a while. But, you know, there was this idea that, like, if you were writing an offer, like, you wanted the house and, and, they, and the seller knew that. And so you just kind of worked together to get a deal done. That's gone. That's gone. So, um, so I was disappointed Sunday night um, and questioning, you know, everything. And I don't think it's wrong. I mean, if you have experienced what I'm experiencing uh, weekend after weekend after weekend, uh, I don't think it's wrong. Uh, you know, I, I just, I just get frustrated. Uh, and, and, you know, like this weekend in particular, uh, my buyer's, on the second one, I, I texted them anymore. Like it used to be call people and you apologize profusely for not being able to get the offer done. And now I just, I don't even bother. I, I text and they know it's coming because we, we've been rejected on so many other houses. And you say, well, John, you just have to offer more money. It's like, guys, I know, I know, I know what you need to do, but there are constraints in the marketplace that people don't understand. And one of those constraints is your buyer's ability to buy a house. Okay. And let me try to put this together in something that makes sense. And it's probably not. Let's assume my buyer's approved for $200,000 on a mortgage. Now you may say, well, ha ha ha. Those people are poor guys. That's, that's a good job these days. That's a good job at five and a half percent interest. That's a $200,000 house. I mean that you have a good job and you can afford a $200,000 house. That's it. So, I mean, forget this half a million dollar stuff. This is, you know, this is first time young home buyers. Two hundred thousand dollars is more money than they've ever spent before, and like that's all they have. And so you say, well, okay, well you can't look at houses for two hundred thousand. And you're like, I agree with that. We're looking at houses in the one fifties and one sixties, and they're getting bid up to two hundred thousand, and they don't warrant a two hundred thousand dollar price tag. That's the issue. That's the real issue. I mean, I. There, there has to be some basis for reality on the home prices. And like, let's just go over the comps for this house uh, this weekend. There was nothing that sold over like 180. And our offer was over 180. You know, I mean, we were way over asking. There were some unique things about this property that I, you know, that I was uncomfortable with, but it, it was an, it was a house where my buyers had to make an offer. And so they did. So let's, let's go over the email because I got an email and I want you to understand the rejection and how it goes because it's great. Okay. It says, here you go. You get, hello. You don't even get your name. Hello. My seller has selected another offer. Many of the offers were strikingly similar. 
with one that stood out both in dollars and terms. Okay, well, that offer that stood out in both dollars and terms, number one, they're going to be way over asking. Number two, they're going to be probably cash. Number three, um, it's going to be such a terrible offer for the um, buyers that they will have buyer's remorse at some point. But whatever, it says the numbers, 35 showings between Thursday and today. That doesn't really mean anything. And that's pretty low, actually. 26 groups at the open house. I don't even I don't even care. And then eight offers received. So we were one of eight. It says two offers waived inspections altogether. Four more waived negotiation period, as is, or manipulated terms of the negotiations. Well, let's go over that. Uh, let me just check and make sure I'm still good. Okay, so first off, uh, two offers waived inspections altogether. So what that, that means is um, you're buying the house and, and we do, we're not even getting an inspection. Or if we do get an inspection, it's for informational purposes only. Okay, so that's what that is. And then four more waived the negotiation period as is or manipulated terms of the negotiation. So when it says four more waived inspection periods, so they say, you know, we're going to, you know, we're, we're not, we're not even interested in getting an inspection for the house, like at all. So it's not for informational purposes only. We're not even worried about that. And then it says, or manipulated terms of the negotiations. So that's probably where my offer fell, just to be honest with you. Um, I have, I have knowledge that I, that I, you know, I don't feel like sharing with you. <laughs> um, not that, not that you're going to go out and become this awesome agent off of, off of the things I do, but just like some things I think should be kept private. So I, I won't talk about that. Then it says three offers did not require uh, St. Louis city occupancy inspection. I mean, I don't, I don't care. Like th this particular house, they were not asking for an as is offer to start. So I was like, eh. Uh, five offers either waived appraisal or had strong appraisal gap coverage. Um, in this market, if you do have an appraisal and you don't get the, I mean, and you can't, I mean, it just doesn't work. So you almost every, I mean, as based on this, everyone um, waived an appraisal, which makes sense. Uh, two offers used escalation clauses. That makes sense to me. One offer was not contingent on financing. Um, so that means it's a cash offer, basically. Uh, one offer requested closing cost credits. That person's a moron. That offer was never going to happen. Earnest money generally sat around 1% to 1.5%. 1 um, closing was typically set to 25, 30 days. All seven offers had rights to a survey. Now, he said he had eight offers received. And seven of them now had rights to a survey. Absolutely. In this particular home, you're an idiot if you don't get a survey. Um, so anyway, that's that. Now, I'm told in the marketplace, I'm told in the marketplace that that's not true, that, um, that what I just experienced didn't happen. Like I'm, I've been told that the market has uh, shifted and that it's not, it's not difficult. That's what I've been told. So, I mean, obviously if I've read it, it must be tr true, even though I'm living it. The other offer is a lot more complicated. I wrote an offer um, and that we can talk about like this. Look, when you, when you see a house and it has visible issues, do you write an offer with the understanding that this house has issues and then condition your offer as such? Or do you write a ridiculous offer and then wait for a situation where you know there's issues and then try to back out of the offer? Uh, my buyer and I just said, look, we see that there's an issue here. This is what we're willing to pay. Get back to us. And of course, we've got nothing. We've got nothing. Um, listing agents are of the mindset that they don't have to work with other agents at this time. Listing agents of the of, of the opinion that they've got a listing and you don't, so, you know, kiss off. I mean, even if they've got no offers, even if they got no other offers, they're still of the opinion that that they that they get everything. Now, 
um, I got a text from the listing agent that said my buyer uh, would like a, f- a full priced offer. I would like a rainbow puppy. Like just because you would like something, you know, I'd like a million dollars. I'd like five people on my live stream at one time. I mean, I mean, it's nice to like things. We all, we all, but, but that's not the reality. What we like and what we're going to get are two different things. This house is, this condo was $20,000 listed $20,000 over anything else in the market. And it was just not that great. Just not that great. And so, you know, we were nice enough to put in an offer. We felt apparently the sellers didn't feel that way or the, the seller's agent didn't convey that to the sellers. That's, that's, that's one of the issues you have with um, one of the, one of the issues you have with, you know, at listing homes. Are you really as a listing agent going to go to your seller that you've never met that you've, you've been referred by? Uh, to, to these people, and are you really going to go in there and they say, "Well, we want let's just say their house is worth two fifty, and you walk into the listing appointment, and they say, "We want three hundred thousand dollars," and there's there's nothing that you can do to change our mind. Are you going to tell them? Are you going to go and say the house isn't worth three hundred thousand dollars? Are you going to take the listing at three hundred thousand dollars and then six months later lower the price? I think ninety nine percent of the people are going to take the listing and try to lower the price, and then when they get fired, they'll pick somebody else. I don't like to work that way. And so I don't, but it hurts me. It hurts me and it hurts me when I list property. So let's just as an example, like, so let's say a house, like what I like to do is I like to talk about a listing strategy. So what is our listing strategy? Are we going to list the house at the highest point and hope somebody comes in just a little lawyer, lawyer, lower? Uh, so what, what, what sellers tend to think is like, well, we only need one person to buy the house, so it's totally okay. But you really, you really need a lot more than one person to walk through the house. I mean, to get any chance of selling it. So you want to price it where it could actually sell. But so let's just say you want to go, okay, well, if we're at the high end, what do we need to do? Well, we need to have the house needs to be perfect. The windows need to be washed. Carpets need to be cleaned. You know, everything needs to be staged. Then maybe, but most people aren't in that percentage. So you're going to be less than that. And so then what are we going to do, you know, for that asking price? And then this issue arises like this. Watch, I go over to house. Like, what is the criteria that you're going to use to select a real estate agent? Let's say you called three listing agents. Okay. And deep in your, deep down in your heart, in your soul, is it going to be the person that you get along best with? Probably, probably. Are you going to say that to the listing agents? No, no. So what is, I'll ask, you know, what is the criteria? What, what do I need to do to list this house? And people will say, well, you have, you know, you have to be the cheapest and you have to, it's like, okay, great. So that's just kind of a dumb question. But, but let me just put it this way. Like, let's say you go to a house and an agent before you says the house is worth 270. You say it's worth 280 and the person behind you says it's worth 290. Now on a on a two hundred thousand dollar house, close to a three hundred thousand dollar house, is ten thousand dollars a really big difference? No, no. Your offers can vary. You know, you may get more than that, you may get less than that, but it's it's normally in ten thousand dollar increments anyway. So what are we really what are we really talking about here? It's it's do I get along with the person? Um, I hate to say it, but like if I were if I were a little more attractive, like I would help. Young, young, vivacious, attractive. Um, usually gets the sale every time. And, I, and I'm totally okay. I mean, I get it. You know, like I've, I've been on earth now 40, close to 45 years. I, I understand. I understand that that it's not necessarily about the knowledge you bring. It's, it's kind of how you present it, for lack of a better word. And it's okay. And the other thing is, is, you know, some people don't like that. Some people want to have somebody that's knowledgeable and somebody that they can get along with. And so normally in those cases, I excel. So anyway, um, you know, we take a listing and it's, it's, you know, it's over asking. They know, they know, they, they know that it's over, over, overpriced, but this agent in particular, they just take listings. They don't care. And I don't blame them. I understand. I get it. I get it. Uh, are they a bad agent? 
No, that's one of the things. Oh, I'm sorry. I got to scratch my ear. One of the things I've, I've, I've often pondered in my career is, you know, how do you define a good agent? Does a, is, is the best agent the one that gets the most deals, the most listings? I mean, by, by some metric, yes. I mean, I know what a horrible agent is. I can tell you what a horrible, a horrible agent gets an offer. It's very close to asking and it, towards the tail end of a dying market. And that agent gets on the phone immediately and says, hey, can we work out a deal? I need this. Uh, what is your what is your buyer need? How can we work this out? That's not happening. And these people that have just gotten into the real estate business are not are not going to be able to sustain themselves when this when this boom leaves us because they're just not used to making deals. But by that time, you know, 16 other people, you know, 16, I don't know, a thousand other agents will come into the marketplace. So anyway, so Sunday or so so Sunday, you know, the whole day you're kind of like on edge, and that's another thing. So, you know, for me, I'm living these deals. I'm living these deals, and it's 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 hard on my body, and it's hard on my mind. Um, I want my buyers to get houses, right? And when they don't, it's like, it hurts. I mean, this is, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you what it's like. And so, I mean, oh, so, you know, Sunday, am I crushed? Well, first I got to make sure my buyers aren't too crushed. And then, yes, yes, I'm beat up. I've worked all weekend for this moment only to be denied. So then Monday comes around. I go to bed defeated Sunday night. And I, I mean, it's it's true. And then uh, Monday rolls around, and I don't. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not doing well in the sense that, like, um, uh, the best the best way I can explain to you the feeling is, um, it's it's not. It's ambivalence. It's ambivalence. I don't care about about anything like i'm just i'm trying to put stuff like back together basically um well am i broken as a human every every time we don't get deals it's not great i'll tell you it, it's been it's been bad um but it takes i mean for the amount of work it hurts like it, it hurts really bad and it doesn't make you want to talk online. It doesn't want to make you live stream. It doesn't make you want to do anything. It doesn't make you want to look at houses. It doesn't make you want to, you know, do anything. And so that's the situation that I find myself in on Monday. And so when you're in a situation like that, the, the next best thing to do, I, I think, is to, you know, find something that, that gives you a, a zest for employment. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is as far as, you know, if it's not real estate related, like, what is it? So yesterday, um, I know I, I, we did this on Friday because I was miserable on Friday too, before the stuff even started. Um, I went to get something to eat. I went to a restaurant, a local restaurant with my wife for lunch. And then during lunch, my phone started ringing and I started having to handle all kinds of problems. And that was the day. By the time the day was over, I had, I, I mean, I literally just answered calls and, and went back and forth and I didn't have a chance, chance to do a live stream. Now, I just wasn't really in a, in a mindset to be able to do a live stream. It, to, like to me, I'm, I'm sure it's not true for others. It's hard for me to carry a live stream by myself daily, do the business and, and not get tired. Um, I don't want to carry the live stream. I want you to come and play with me. You know, come on the live stream. Let's chat. Let's have some fun. But I just can't seem to to break through on that. And that's also something. I mean, think about this. If you've encountered failure now for um, when well, I started last year on YouTube and my main channel is not great, but it's doing OK. And then I've got this channel, my live stream channel that I split off. I mean, 
it's tough. It's tough. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm picking up subscribers, but I mean, this is this it's, it's, it very much reminds me of blogging in 2017. So I'm writing these blogs on my website and they're getting traction, but I mean, it's people from India, no offense to the people of India, but I'm not, they're not buying a house in St. Louis. So I'm getting all these, I'm getting all this website traffic. That's totally worthless to me. And then finally, like, like finally the blogging, just no one's going to the website at all, no matter what you write, because people have gone to, you know, different platforms they are on Twitter. They're on YouTube. They're, they're not just going straight to a website anymore. I mean, in my opinion, and if they are, they're going to like a Zillow. They're not going, they're not, they don't, Deerwood Realty isn't on the top of their list of places they're going online. Should be if you're in St. Louis, but if you're not, I, I get it. But anyway, so we stopped blogging because it was like, you know, it takes an hour or two to write a, a blog post that no one sees. And so you go to, to you know, you go to YouTube and, um, you know, blogging ran out of time. I mean, that's the only thing I can say is it ran out. I mean, like it became irrelevant. Maybe, maybe some people laugh at me and say, oh, I'm doing the best I've ever done with blogging. And it's like, well, good for you. It's not, it's not where I'm at. Um, and, you know, it's funny. Um, I was talking to my web guy. I do have a web guy. I do have a custom site, but I, I do have a web guy too that I talk to um, most of the, most of the stuff. And he said, you know, Hey, we can, you know, we can start a campaign and we can do this. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, I can't pick up more buyers right now. I've got 10 buyers and every weekend we get crushed. And even if I sold one house, there's still nine other buyers. And I'm one guy with my colleague who has a couple other uh, buyers, but we, we just, don't have the capacity now you say well hire more agents and it's like no that's a different business so and then you could argue well that's the business that you're in john it's like well that's true but i've just never been i've never been the kind of broker that kind of goes out and and tries to get people to i, I don't try to recruit people so much i did recruit for a while uh, for a different office and i found it to be interesting because everyone likes to be recruited Everyone likes to, it's flattering. It's flattering. Um, and I, I was okay at it, but as far as recruiting people in my own brokerage, um, I would prefer people just show up. I mean, if you've been in the business long enough, you know, the games, you know, the games. And so like, why don't you just go someplace like mine where, you know, no one's going to bother you just do your work and just be left alone. And, and, you know, there's probably a, a million agencies like mine though in the United States where it's just do your work. And, 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 you know, what's funny is, is like, do brands matter? Not really, not really the people matter. Like you're working with a person, not a brand. Um, and there's all kinds of good brand managers in, in the brokerage world. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's an agent in front of you. That's most of the time, um, going to do the business. So anyway, I, I was tired. I was tired and, um, you know, just yesterday taking the day off. Now you say, well, you took off Saturday, so you should have had plenty of ammo on, on it. It didn't work that way. It didn't work. But today, I mean, I feel great. And oddly enough, last night I have the Deerwood Realty Clips channel and, you know, it's, it's good because the live stream is so long. Uh, there's stuff that gets missed or there's stuff that I want to highlight that I'm not able to on the live stream. And so, you know, we put it on the clips channel and on the clips channel, I had a wonderful time watching um, what I would say is the evolution of the channel. Today's, you know, Friday was a major moment for the channel because it showed that we could do some other things. We didn't have to stay so formulaic. Now I think we're going to do some other things differently. And let's talk about that. It's we're 35 minutes in. So I used, I used to want to showcase, you know, what luxury properties look like in the United States right now um, and around the United States. And what I found was it's not, it's, it's not really compelling. 
I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because the average viewer isn't buying a $35 million house. But it's just not. And, and then I also looked at it from a, a, a an idea, a perspective of, you know, it breaks up the show. It's something different. And, you know, maybe people would be interested in seeing what I, I mean. I look at listings all the time. And I thought, let's look at listings together. We could talk about it. Now, it didn't work. It didn't work. Now, I can't show you a graph as to, like, during my show, what, what parts make the most, you know, what parts are viewed more often than others and when people click. I can do it on my, you know, my podcast videos. But anyway, it, nobody, it just didn't seem like it, it worked. And so I'm dumping it. It's, uh, it's June 7th of 2022. I'm dumping the, the luxury listings. I don't care. Why? Well, I told you, I don't think anybody else likes it. And uh, what I run into is, you know, I've only got like 200 cities in the United States that I can pay attention to. And then when I look at these listings, like a lot of the listings don't sell for years. So I'm looking at the same listing over and over again. Ah. So what I'm going to do to change that, um, I, I think two things. One, I'm going to stretch out the introduction. Um, and then the second thing is, is I'm going to do more real estate articles, more real estate related articles, probably not the hard news articles, um, but just stuff to, to talk about. Um, kind of try to kind of get a, a wider range. The concern that I've had is that the live stream and the podcast are, are really, really similar. And that's true. Um, so what it was happening was, is I refused to use certain news on a podcast when I could use it for a live stream, but I refused to use certain news on the live stream when I could use it for a podcast, but I don't think that's the right way to approach it. I think that all the real estate news, um, we just discuss and sometimes it's a podcast and sometimes it's a live stream. Now on a live stream, obviously I can go through much more content faster than I can, um, with the podcast. Um, but We'll just see. It doesn't. It doesn't seem like there's ever a lack of real estate news. Uh, one of the problems that I'm running into, like I watch LawTube, especially Nick Ricada, uh, Ricada Law. And I, if you don't watch his live streams, um, I suggest you watch them for a. Uh, how do I put it? For a lesson in how to run a live stream. He's great. He's great, and hopefully someday. I can get enough subscribers to where he will come on and we can talk about stuff because he's just a fascinating individual. Uh, he's got a range of, of things he can talk about that I don't have any, I don't have any knowledge of, which, which makes it even more interesting. But anyway, uh, you know, watching him, you know, you pick up stuff and, and I don't think there's been a time I've, I don't I don't think I've ever seen him talk about. Um, well, I've never seen him talk about listings, high end listings, because he doesn't do real estate. But he's talked in the past about like tree litigation. Oh, that'd be fascinating. That'd be fascinating on a live stream. Um, and then the the thing that made him stand out to where he is now, which is ridiculous. I was watching him before. He would put out videos um, and I, I liked him, but he didn't, he didn't feel like he'd ever get the, uh, the push from YouTube that he needed. So he was doing live streams as well. And um, the live streams were great. Okay. But then he came up with, you know, actually just going like there's a couple, there's a couple court approved feeds. And so he started, um, just covering trials that were of interest. The Rittenhouse trial, um, he covered now Johnny Depp. And now on the Johnny Depp, it's all different. I mean, there's all these lawyers and they're all talking about it um, because they see the success that he had. But there's something special about his um, his streams. And it was from before, is from before Rittenhouse. There was something about them that was fantastic. So anyway, on my stuff, I don't, there's nothing that happens live that we can talk about in real time that's not copyright 
material. Like I, I can't broadcast a game, you know, I can't broadcast. And then there's this, there's this issue of client confidentiality. So I can't really show you, you know, I'm, I'm, go, I'm going on a listing appointment. I mean, that's not going to work. That's not going to work unless everything is fake. And see, that's the issue. Like, I love, like, you know, flip this house. And I don't know if it's flipped, uh, love it or list it, that one. Like, they go to, like, three other houses and, like, try to sell the person, you know, the, the current homeowners on these other houses instead of fixing up their own. Uh, the same way with the property brothers. Like, look, though, all that stuff is, like, not real. And I, I don't mean it in a negative way. There's real parts of it. But there, there's no question that in this market, there's no way they're waiting. There, there's no way they're getting a film crew in three houses, okay, while it's, while it's active. It's just not happening. I'm telling you. Like, like you, you know, last week I was trying to get in a house for the last two weeks and couldn't do it. I couldn't even get in. And you're telling me that they can film uh, during – it's just – it's not happening. Is that a bad th – I don't – all I'm saying is, is it's not something that's compelling enough that I can do it. And so, I, so I'm, I'm kind of toast there. And then um, that's it. There's no way to do like real life commentary on breaking real estate news as it's happening because there's no like, it doesn't work that way. So that's disappointing. Um, but I'm glad he found a, a way to do it. I, I think about it a lot. Like it, it's weird. If you're a car channel, Okay, there's many different ways you can you can be successful. One of those ways is just you go get a car and you have endless content on the car. Now, if you're smart, you buy a car that not many people have and that people would aspire to own. If you're broke, you buy a car that you can afford and hope that someone else will watch it. That's what I see a lot of my uh, fellow car youtubers doing and i and i i feel for you guys i get it it's 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 hard and so especially when you see somebody that's made it and you're like i can't i can't afford a lamborghini so i get it um so like i said we're going to do more news more opinion and then uh and see if that works i've been doing the uh, I've been doing the the luxury properties for over for almost a year and it, and it just hasn't worked. And at some point, you just have to say, "I'm done. I'm done." I hope you understand. So I wanted to go over. I mean, there's plenty. Like, what happens to me? What happens to me when? things aren't going well is I, I, I shut down. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no expressions. There's no, there's nothing. It's just like all internal. And, uh, I just, you know, because we're here, I just wanted to go over at night just so that you can see what it's like. So sometimes when I try to sleep, there's so many issues like in front of me that I can't get past them to like to the sleep they show up as like rocks and it's like i'm just trying to get through these rocks so that i can i can sleep so my mind can be at ease and uh and so you know yesterday like like there were all these things firing on me at once like the deals and um you know ways to negotiate them and how I lost and what I could do better. And I mean, just all this stuff is just firing at me. And uh, it's very hard to, uh, to deal with that over time. Uh, and so basically today is the first day where there's like an ability to kind of focus my thoughts instead of them just attacking from every direction like they were yesterday. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about today with you is something that I found fascinating. And I've, 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 I may have brought it up before, but let's talk about it. And that is, are you guys, are you guys familiar with 
Alan Dershowitz. Okay, Alan Dershowitz is a famous, famous attorney. And you say, well, he's not very famous. I've never heard of him. Well, it's it's an age thing. To me, he is most well known for his defense of O.J. Simpson, which I'm going to look it up just because it's it's been it's been a while. Um, the O.J. Simpson trial. was um it started in 1994 so i mean it's 2022 and i think like some of the kids that i that are you know 18 they were born like 2005 it's like they, they didn't know they didn't see it or they were too young to see it. So anyway, I I'm not into I don't like I I I don't know what happened. I don't know if OJ really did it. I don't know. But anyway, Dershowitz got him off the hook. I think he was involved with the Clintons. But anyway, he was I didn't really know his poli- I didn't really know his politics and I still really don't I haven't really cornered his politics. I don't know if he's left leaning. Uh, I know he takes a lot of flack now from everyone. Uh, he's pretty much been disgraced, I would say, which is kind of its own weird, weird thing. He's not, he's like, he's a human and he's lived a long life in the public eye and he's taken a lot of arrows to the back. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. Uh, so anyway, he, he had a lot, he has a YouTube channel, the Dirt Show. It's also an Apple podcast and he was doing it maybe six months ago. And, uh, I don't know something about it. It was great. Okay. It was, it was great. And then he stopped doing it for a while, but he's been doing it, I guess for another, like last, last couple of months, different format. Um, but he's getting like, first of all, I didn't even know it. I ended up on Twitter. I was following him on Twitter and then he started, you know, here, I've got a show. I didn't know it was back. And so I started, I watched it yesterday or the day before. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, I mean, uh, there's like lawyers and then there's like, like, like lawyers that know what they're doing and you can see it on law tube. There's some people that have never even been in the courtroom. It doesn't look like, or the last time they were, they were, uh, I don't even clerks or something like they were like paralegals. I mean, they, I mean, and then you've got this guy and what's funny is on YouTube, he's getting like a thousand views. Okay. Probably one of the preeminent lawyers in the United States since the 1960s or seventies, he clerked on the Supreme court. I mean, he, he, he's been on CNN I mean, I think he's suing them. Um, but I mean, he was a big deal. He was, he was made in the media, you know, like he, he has every, he has name recognition, like you would not believe. And, and here he's, he's pulling in a thousand views on a, on a video, a thousand. I don't even know what his subscriber count is. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. I'm not doing this for like, I'm not doing it to like, he got 18,000 he's got 18,000 subscribers okay Peta law has 467,000 subscribers now i think he's not doing as well as emily d baker but emily d baker is she's got 632,000 subscribers emily d baker is different than Rakeda in that she does a lot of uh, like celebrity stuff I don't, I don't mean it's, it's not a negative, but anyway, Alan Dershowitz, 18,000 subscribers. I mean, it's just amazing to me it, what, it, what, it, I don't know what it means to me is, uh, what do I say? Like, it's not a, there's no question. It's not a level playing field, but, uh, 
it's it says it's tough. Everyone gets mad at Legal Eagle. He has 2.37 million subscribers. It's just the world of YouTube is crazy. Crazy. And that just shows you. So uh for for you on my live stream, you may say, Well, what are you rocking, John? I've got 13 subscribers. Yeah. 13. 13 subscribers. Yeah. How's that going for you? Well, it's not going very well. I mean, I'm not I'm not the Durst show. But it, it's fine. Whatever. Whatever. So now that I've gotten this far into it, um, let's go over some some quick stuff. You know, I do care about certain things. Let's let's go here. Let's go here and let's go over here. I don't want to do this right now. I'm going to do this first. This was the Deerwood Realty website, DeerwoodRealtySTL.com. I have a bottom. I have a survey for interest rates. Um, oh, my God. Look at my last tweet. Now, this isn't fair because I do retweets and those don't come in here. But today's going to be fantastic. I can already tell. So here we go. The 30-year fix is up uh, six basis points, and now we're at five and a half percent. Um, that's not good. So the on latest analysis, we can click that, and it'll take us to, uh, we'll take it to here. And it says rates jump to levels to highest levels in nearly a month. Last week's mortgage rate momentum served to reverse three of the best consecutive weeks in nearly a year. Themselves a reversal of the first, the worst four months since the '80s. Even after last week's jump, rates remained safely below the long-term time seen in early May. Now, after a new week began with another volatile jump, the distance isn't quite so safe. It says the bond market took damage on silver fronts today with losses accelerating the most between 10 and 11 a.m. During that time, European bond market drama coincided with increased domestic bond issuance concerns. It says more issuance equals lower bond prices and higher bond yield rates, as well as plain old momentum and technicals. Um, all of the above is a complicated way of saying rates moved up quite a bit higher today as far as single days go. The average lender is at least an eighth of a percent higher than they were on Friday. The average conventional 30-year fixed rate is once again back up to at least 5.5%, depending on number of midday price changes made by any given lender. It's not good. Not good. Whatever you think of that, let's put it right here. Now, this I just wanted to go over. I, I actually I want to I want to frame this a certain way. So I was uh, I was in the car on Saturday with some clients, and we were driving, and uh, I was driving them around because we were. It was like the the houses were close, and it was just easier to catch a ride with me than it would be to. Uh, walked every house and uh one of the houses we decided was like it was perfect for like a a, a house in england and the whole the whole thing was kind of interesting but i'll get into that maybe some other time anyway they're like yeah we were watching the queen's jubilee and they're like do you have any did you do you care about and i'm like i'm not talking about this because as you know i've taken a few shots at the queen and the whole monarchy and i will continue to do so because i think it's ridiculous So here we go. Prince William and Kate Middleton speak out following kids' debut at the Trooping of the Color. The couple reflected on day one of the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. So they're going to speak out. Now, how courageous. First of all, let me, let me couch it like this. Right now I'm speaking out to all of 13 people, if I'm lucky. It's not very courageous to speak out when you have an, a built-in audience for just being born. Like that's that's to me. You may say, "Are you jealous of the monarchy?" No. Well, I mean, I think I am jealous in the sense that they managed to pull this off, and people pe keep falling for this garbage. But anyway, let's continue. It says the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge experienced a historic day on Thursday. Not only did they celebrate in the Queen's seventy years on the throne, but their three children made their carriage debut at the Trooping the Color. 
at trooping the color. Oh, great. We made a carriage de debut. It was a first for the three, and they rode alongside their mother, Kate, who donned a beautiful white coat dress from Alexander McQueen and a Philip Tracy hat and the Duchess of Cornwall, who looked elegant in a baby blue ensemble. I love this. I love this. So we don't even just like it's like an ad from like a long time ago. You know, who are you wearing? Who are the why don't we know what the kids are wearing? As the day came to an end, the royal couple took to Instagram to share their thoughts on the big day. Now, I'm supposed to believe, no, no offense to these people, but I'm supposed to believe that these folks, you know, they were at the trooping the color event. And then it just it just occurred to them, like, hey, let's share this wonderful event with our Instagram followers, because I'm sure they spend a lot of time like, how do I get more in? I'm monarchy. I'm a monarchy. I'm a, I'm a royal. How do I spend more time getting Instagram followers? Day one of the Platinum Jubilee. Look at that. They hashtagged it. I mean, they're so good. It's been lovely to see so many of you out today and see how you're already enjoying this weekend. Celebrating Her Majesty the Queen, they wrote, they wrote alongside a picture, uh, the, alongside a picture of the Tree of Trees, which stands 70 feet tall in honor of the Queen outside Buckingham Palace. Look, they're in a carriage. Like, why don't they have a Pope mobile? Because they're not the Pope. Before their social media message was shared, Prince William joined the Queen, although separated by 22 miles in the beacon lighting ceremony. Speaking about trooping, Prince William revealed it was pretty impressive and a big day. <laughs> William was speaking to Mike Bloomberg, sponsor of Tree of Trees, and said, it was a big day today, pretty impressive. Did you see the fly past? Uh, the Duke watched on his screen as the Queen's ceremonial lit the principal beacon from the Windsor Castle. Now, I don't know how that happened. She probably flipped a switch, but maybe it was a royal switch. Maybe it was encrusted gold switch, not like the one you can get at Home Depot for 99 cents. The lights illuminated the tree of trees outside the palace, and he heard Gregory Porter perform the official beacon's song called A Life Lived with Grace. Wow. Wow. Now, again, this article, the headline is they speak out. They're speaking out. And it's like, what are we what are we getting here? We're not getting a lot of speaking out. This is a game we play on YouTube all the time, too. If you write something sensational, like, let's see, you won't believe what this live stream is about. Well, you'll click on it and clickbait. But I mean, really, so it's just hours before the rare night engagement. Buckingham Palace released a statement revealed that the Queen will be unable to attend Friday's Jubilee service. It stated that Her Majesty was greatly enjoying her birthday celebration and the fly past in the London during the Trooping the Color Parade. However, she did experience some discomfort due to which she will be pulling out of Friday's National Thanksgiving service. Taking into account the journey and activity required to participate in tomorrow's National Service of Thanksgiving at St. Paul's Cathedral, Her Majesty with great reluctance, has concluded that she will not attend the statement read. Her Majesty's a very nice girl. She used to be a friend of mine. I believe that's a Beatles song. Don't know. Maybe I've got the words messed up. But anyway, I don't really think that they they were speaking out. Speaking out of turn? I don't know. I'm trying to get back to my... Trying to get back to here. So... I mean, you might be like, hey, that was pretty pretty not real estate related. You're right. I don't like the monarchy. I'm sorry. I say, well, John, if you were, no, I wouldn't. I would just, I, I would, I would abdicate my throne. I just, I don't want to have anything to do with those people. I live in the United States. We don't have the monarchy. I know that the press tries to make a monarchy out of our presidents and out of senators and out of those people, but we don't have a monarchy. And as long as I, I can, I will fight the idea of one in the United States. I think it's stupid. Anyway. Anyway. So, like, maybe you want to know what I'm doing the rest of the day. I have to go to a lunch. I have to meet with some clients for lunch. I have to go... Um, I have to go, I got to fix some searches for some of my buyers. The, the market's changed. It has changed. So I got to kind of update that. And then 
I mean, editing. Well, I do. I don't know if I got to get back to my podcast, but it, it hasn't been easy. Um, I've been I've been busy, so I don't know if I'm going to get that done. But uh, let's go over the the week that I know. Tomorrow, I hope to be uh, live streaming at 9 a.m. I, I hope to be back into it. I hope I've caught my muse again, and then I can I can swing it. Uh, Thursday, I have to go somewhere early in the morning, so I won't be able to live stream at nine. Normally, what happens I've found is if I don't live stream right in the morning, my day gets taken away from me by the, the pressing needs of of what I have to do to service the clients that I have, and uh, you know run the business. So it may not be at nine. Well, it won't be at nine on Thursday. Um, hopefully, it will be at some. It'll be around. Like hopefully, we'll have one. Uh, Friday seems to be good. Saturday, hopefully we can we can live stream on Saturday. You know, I used to live stream every day, and I've gotten away from it because I, I thought like one day off was a relief. Um, how do I say this? Uh, I have like I have tremendous respect for people that do live streams. Uh, it's not easy. Maybe it's easier. Like maybe they have a gift to be able to do it. Um, I am not. I'm not that gifted. It it takes energy for me to do one. It takes an effort. Um, things don't just naturally occur to me to talk about. So I have a lot of respect uh, for those people. I would also say that I have a respect for people's ability to be consistent. Um, I'm not that way. I've never been that way. Uh, I've always had like times of great production and then times of just nothing like so I, I don't, I don't think that's changing, uh, but I did want to, I did want to say, you know, hey, uh, I I can appreciate people that do the live stream every day or that, and especially at night. You know, I've I've got that one live stream that I like to do, but I've just been so tired at night lately. I got to get back to it, um, but that's again, that's a lot of content. So anyway, that being said, I'm going to head out. Thank you for watching. I'll catch you tomorrow. Bye.